Hey there, welcome back to the Path to Zion podcast, where we are rediscovering the ancient way. I'm chuckling a little bit because we are moving today into part eight of the present video series. Part eight, inhabitants who were meant to sojourn, a call to come out. And I know back when I when I first introduced this um, study, this topic, I said very clearly that this could be very lengthy, and really, it, it, it's a it's a well that has no bottom; it has no end. Um, and we are we are thoroughly seeing that come to pass as we move into part eight. Thank you for for joining us today. If you're watching or if you're listening to the audio portion over at pathdesign.com, um, thank you. Um, <laughs> especially. Super thanks for enduring this long. Um, we're basically eight hours in already in the first, well, because you had the introduction and then seven parts. And this is a, this is a topic of, of history, of information that we could literally spend days and days and weeks and months discussing. Um, and, and so we're going to review a little bit. It's been four days since I did part seven and I've just been sitting again on, on, on where we are, where the ground we've covered. I've just kind of been parked here for a little bit on purpose. Um, not wanting to be too, too swift to reveal these things. I realize I, I try to get my mind in, in the, the understanding and the mindset of the average patriotic Christian evangelical and keep reminding myself that this would be hard if you heard this for the first time um, or if you've heard it before but maybe didn't give it any attention or or even if you've heard it you know for the very first time and like you're really offended and and hurt and I un- I feel like in measure anyway I understand that I I get that. I mean, I've had that in other areas of my life of doctrinal beliefs or understanding towards certain things that I had to just step back and realize maybe this is to my detriment. And and as with anything, we have to then check our hearts and see if we're willing to lay it down and let it go. Just a little bit of, of, of backstory. We have to just at least continually cover where we've been in measure in this series, Inhabitants Who Were Meant to Sojourn. Um, We started off just kind of laying a groundwork, a foundation, if you will, of of a call to come out of, of anything and everything that is not of the Father, anything that Yahweh himself did not establish for his people to be among, within, then it should not be for us it should be detestable it should anything that is opposing of of a of a kingdom that is yet before us a new jerusalem zion reality that is yet before us where yahweh himself will place his name we have to be careful that in our hearts we're always continually reassessing our dwelling our abode and, and the, the roots, if you will, that we establish wherever it is we, we land in the earth, in whatever time frame, whatever age we are in. And again, I, I need to make this clear that we're not talking about moving geographically. We're not talking about to be a sojourner, biblically speaking, you have to be one who geographically moves with some sort of, you know, ordered or accidental regularity. We're not talking about that. We're talking about our heart's condition, our heart's posture of what is our home. Are we really truly living as aliens here? Um, Of course, we started out hours ago talking about the doctrinal, biblical differences between the word sojourner and dweller. And the main difference between those two, Old Testament to New, and how It set up an understanding of one who is a sojourner, a biblical sojourner that that began with Abraham to leave and go to a land which I will show you. It established a biblical pattern, a first pattern, if you will, of, of Yahweh God creating and forming a people 
that was looking for a redeemed, restored, Edenic, covenantal reality with the eternal creator, Yahweh, that is something we are traveling unto and we're, we're looking towards it. We are constantly mindful of where we're headed and reminding ourselves that we are not called to be permanent dwellers of the nations. We talked about the Goyim principle in tiny measure about the nations. God's people are scattered out in, in, in among the nations, but we are not called to this nationalism-based living that permeates the Christian church in every facet that we've talked about, every denomination, every movement. One thing that's, that's, that is consistent, which is very interesting to me, a consistent, congruent factor within the wide way church, no matter where you land, is, for the most part, patriotism, nationalism, um, an identity that is firmly rooted in a national patriotic heritage. And I am convinced that, that part of the, the, what the Spirit is saying in this hour call that is a, is a faint whisper because it's drowned out by the, by the warrior chants of patriotic Christian America is a, is a voice crying out saying, don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> Don't fall to the pagan idolatrous ways of your fathers. Be free. Come out. Be separate. So we've talked about all of these things and much, much more. I'm going to just kind of flip through some pages here to see if there's any hot points that we need to um, bring up again. Um, we looked up the Greek understanding of one who is sojourning as he is awaiting his native country. Again, I love that mindset. We're awaiting something. We are longing for, we are anticipating journeying unto something that is yet before us, a covenantal promise that the Father will bring his people into. We're waiting. Sojourn in this land. Of course, we looked at in great measure which was the primary text, and we're going to continue to go back to it as we kind of get to an end of this series. Of the story of Isaac redigging the wells of his father in Genesis, of course, and how in, 20, in chapter 26, verse 2, Yahweh says, dwell where I tell you. Verse 3, sojourn in this land. Verse 8, Isaac chose to dwell. He chose to stay a long time. It looked like he was blessed, favored, he reaped. He was wealthy, he had all these awesome things, but the frustration came from the inhabitants of the land that, that drove Isaac to move. Again, I, 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 have, I have to keep reiterating this. I have to. The account of Isaac and the dwellers of the land. I have said already in this, in this series, and I'll say it again, I am convinced that Yahweh sent the inhabitants of the land to Isaac to frustrate his ways, to run him off, because I, I believe he will not, he would not have left otherwise. He would not have left. And Christian evangelical patriotic America will not leave. She will not pull up her roots and move on. She won't tear down her dwellings and move until the inhabitants of the land are, are released by the Father, if you will to do their purpose, which is to say, hey, this is ours. You move on, which Isaac did. He left, ran off again. He left, ran off again. We know the pattern. We've established that clearly. And I believe it continues into this part today in part eight of what, we're, what we really got into at the end of part six and all of part seven. And we're going to do it again today. And I'll explain why in just a moment. We're looking at, again at why. Why would we leave America? In our hearts now, again, I'm not saying we should all move to here or move to there. I'm not saying that. I'm not promoting, again, a geographical sojourning. I'm talking about a mindset. I'm talking about a heart condition, a heart posture towards what is my home? Where am I to dwell? What am I to do in the here and now as I'm a sojourner awaiting a land that's yet before me? 
And so, again, the end of part six, all of part seven, and again today, we're going to talk about, let's just skip right there. I'm going to take all these 20 pages we've already covered, and we're going to move on. Why? I'm just going to be honest. Why is because people have asked me to. I'm kind of, I'm kind of past it. Um, I said, I've shared on here already, 13 years ago, my wife and I spent over the course of two years setting aside all of our beautiful, you know, American uh, fairy tale understanding in history and started over. And so 13 years ago, we really got to a lot of founding issues that we never really had been told. And that's, that's where all of this has come from. A lot of it I've, I've garnered and added to that this month, the last five weeks or so. But I'm just kind of, I'm ready to do a conclusion. I've got two other really lengthy studies I, I want to get out, I want to share. I'm ready to move on. Um, but several individuals have asked me, could you share some more? One, well, there's several people viewers, listeners, some are friends who have said, I've never, some, some have said, I've never heard this stuff before ever in my life. Can you please share some more? Email me links, send me articles. Others, ah, I, I've known some of this for a while. Keep going. Others have sent me some things that we're going to get to today, probably saying, man, I didn't know this stuff. I know I was called to come out of the world. I know I'm supposed to be separate, holy, consecrated. I've got that. But I never realized the pagan, idolatrous origins of this nation that everybody around me is telling me I'm supposed to defend. And so I'm willing my, uh, myself to do another episode of answering the question, well, why? Why should we leave in our hearts? Why should we leave and come out and be separate from this nationalism-based thinking that somehow the Bible, somehow now, you've been taught this. If you're American, now we have listeners all over the world in, in small measure, not like, I always make this clear, I'm not promoting we have millions of listeners, but not everyone who follows this broadcast is American. But if you are, which you probably are, it's the largest portion of the, of the listeners, you have been told that the Constitution and this Word of God are inseparable. You've been taught, whether by words or by action or just by inheritance, that guns and God are inseparable. Your rights, inseparable from your Christianity. That your forefathers went before you to guarantee you this. You've heard it your whole life. We are, we are exposing many lies we've been handed and told. And it's up to every individual whether or not you want to believe they're true. I understand if you don't want to believe that. I get that. But it's not about what we want. That's back what we started with in the introduction. This isn't about personal preference. This isn't about, well... Do I agree with that? Do I like that? Is that good for me? Does that, you know, it, it doesn't matter. My opinion doesn't matter. And as I've always said in this series throughout it so far, this is not personally advantageous for me and my family. Rebels. You know, I don't, un I don't understand the, the trouble with these things we presented. So, and just before we move into part eight holy. You know, the last part, part seven, if you didn't go watch it, you really need to. <laughs> if you want the answer to the question, why should we come out of America? Why do you think America is pagan and idolatrous? Well, for starters, most people don't understand the, the pagan idolatry behind the traditions of this nation already, like Christmas, like Easter. There's a lot for us to unearth. But there's no end, and that's what I want to make clear. There's no end to this. It's not like, well, we've cleaned the slate of all idolatrous ways in ourselves. Now we're good for the rest of our life. No, the rest of our life is unearthing these things in us that we've been handed. Generations, inheritance of lies. 
Why? Well, our fathers were, were deceived. They were lied to. They only gave us what they knew. It's the pattern of humanity. The further we go, the further out we go from the truth. That's why we're rediscovering the ancient way here. What we've been handed is not that. It's tainted. It's mixed. Yahweh God hates mixing. So that's what we're going to talk about. But but the last part of the um, part seven of the series, man, you've got to look into the in, into the freeze, the F R I S E, I think it is. I don't know. This isn't a grammar class. <laughs> Where's these these carvings? In the most important building in the most important city of this United States, covered in gods and goddesses and ancient lawgivers who are steep neck deep in idolatry and, and, and blatantly said throughout anywhere you look that they received the oracles of law, the wisdom that they received was from gods and goddesses. Clearly known. Everybody understands that. And they're on the wall of this nation, where the laws of this nation are formulated and come out to you and I, they're surrounded literally, literally in the natural, they're surrounded by carvings of men who devoted their lives to receiving the oracles from pagan deities. I don't find that something casually brushed to the side. So go watch that if you haven't already. Let's let's start this series with let's uh, start this episode with with some founding fathers quotations. Now, as with anything, anything we find today, now it's 2021, anything could be disregarded as myth, um, discredited, falsified information. Who knows, right? All we can do really is fact check everything by going to a good handful of different sources, different places. You can find anything and go somewhere else and man, right now I could make up a quote and say, George Washington said this, send, post it on wherever. And people would grab it, repost it. Did you see what he said? We can do that with anything. So we have to be careful. We have to be mature. We have to take time to look into sources. True, yes. Well, I do that. And in doing that, I compiled a reputable list of quotations from the patriotic founding fathers in regards to this nation, who she is, who she was founded to be, their opinion on what they were doing and why they were doing it. So let's just go through some of these and we'll move along today. You'll find some things we're going to get to quite intriguing disturbing man i told a brother today i'm like i can't i can't do this anymore i can't spend i spent i spent three more hours today looking into some of this stuff again because i was asked to do it and so i, I want to be responsible if, if someone's eager to know why this nation is idolatrous man i'm i'm gonna be that guy that's fine <laughs> we're journeying together out of this land so I thought, well, today, I already knew these things years ago, but but I go went back and found them, and, and I made sure again that they're true. The best we can. Quotes from, from some founding fathers. Thomas Jefferson in 1776, All men are equally entitled to the free exercise of religion according to the dictates of conscience. Christianity neither is nor never was a part of the common law. We trust that in the end, man can be governed by reason, not on Christianity. The day will come when the mystical generation of Jesus by the supreme being as his father in the womb of a virgin will be classified with the fable of the generation of Minerva in the brain of Jupiter. Okay, so that's just, that's just grabbing a few from Thomas Jefferson. Now, make a note of Minerva. Who's Minerva? What's he talking about? We're a couple hundred years removed and we're ignorant. She's going to come up on the scene very interesting here later in this episode. Thomas Paine, 1793. I do not believe in the creed professed by the Jewish church, nor by the Roman church, 
by the Greek church or by the Turkish church, by the Protestant church, nor by any church. (laughs) That's pretty clear. All national institutions of churches, whether Jewish, Christian, or Turkish, appear to me no other than human inventions, set up to terrify and enslave mankind and monopolize power and profit. What is it the Bible teaches us? Raping, cruelty, and murder. What is the New Testament teaching us? To believe that the Almighty committed debauchery with a woman engaged to be married, and the belief of this debauchery is called faith. Thomas Paine. Here's another guy you might know, John Adams. We're going to talk about him more in this episode as well. Quote, This would be the best of all possible worlds if there were no religion in it. In the Treaty of Tripoli, if you want to look into something very interesting, go look into that, Treaty of Tripoli. He headed this up in 1797, Adams did. And he said, this is what is in the, in the, the Treaty of Tripoli. It's, it's complicated to, un, to explain. There's a lot going on. Basically, the United States government is trying to reach out and say, look, we're not at odds with you because of your religion. Believe Islam. We Mohammedism, Mohammedism, Mahadnan, and all these different words. Islam. We don't care if you do that. We're, we don't have a problem with that. We're not looking to fight with you over that. We're, we're here to discuss civil issues, governmental issues. We don't care about religion. We're not trying to Christianize you or anyone else. We're just trying to agree, governmentally speaking. And so one, and, and Adams was the one who created this. He headed all of this up in 1797. And this states, quote, The government of the United States of America is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion. 1797. <laughs> Basically, the entire treaty ensured that the nation of America had no interest in establishing a, a single state religion but rather an an all-encompassing freedom of religion. And I keep driving that home throughout this series and in any dialogue I have with another human being. We we have forgotten, as we have been raised up in Bible-believing Protestant churches, that the Founding Fathers, yes, 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 they established freedom of religion, but they established freedom of religion for any religion. Any religion. We touched on that in previous episodes, so we won't rehash all of that again. But it bears mentioning to remind us all the freedom of religion that that Christian evangelicals shout from the rooftops that cannot be taken from us is not just about Christianity. It's not just about your evangelical, Bible-believing church. It is about all religions, including the ones that you hate and say should not, cannot, do not belong here. They made that very clear. We've already talked about that. James Madison. Religious bondage shackles and debilitates the mind and unfits it for every noble enterprise. Benjamin Franklin. I have found Christian dogma unintelligible. Early in life... I absenteed myself from Christian assemblies. Benjamin Franklin, look him up. I said this before. There's stuff about him I wouldn't even really mention in case younger ears are listening. Not a very honorable man. The Pledge of Allegiance, 1892. It did not have under God in it originally. I know a lot of people know that's old news, but I've talked to a lot of people recently that did not know that. It was not in there. It was added in 1954. 1954. Okay? <laughs> that is not very long ago when under God was, was added. In God we trust that, you know, man, don't you see my dollar bill? <laughs> 1957. That made it into being printed on bills. As we've already talked about, like a lot of the root source of this, the main issue, because people say, why is there abortion? Why is there murder? Why is there an LGBT community in my city? Why? The foundation, the cornerstone, the origins of the nation 
are mixed, pagan, idolatrous. It's very simple. Yeshua, Jesus, is not the foundation. He is not the foundation stone. He is not the cornerstone of this nation. Yahweh has not placed his name here. It's irrelevant. <laughs> it is, at, listen to this, okay? Yahweh God has not placed his name upon America. So therefore, it is entirely irrelevant if the patriotic evangelical church does it for him. Do you hear me? It is irrelevant if the church of America, the patriotic Christian Americans, it's irrelevant entirely if they place his name on this nation, because he himself has not. He has not done that. <laughs> We're trying to do it for him, and I keep asking the question of the fruit on the tree. Is that working? Is that working? No. We are not becoming a holy, set-apart, distinct people, set apart unto the Father, looking for a land that is not here. We want to continue to promote the here. We love it here. This is our home. In God we trust. God shed his grace on thee. Come on, come on. And I'm telling you, all the verbiage of the hour of this continual pushing out of negligence, completely neglecting the, the hour, the now. They, this, this started, of course, at col almost culminating in the election. We're almost there. Trump's about to win again and everything is going to be fine. Well, he didn't. He didn't, people. He didn't win. He lost. <laughs> and so now, you know, like there's recounts today. Well, and, and all these messages, man, all this stuff on, on Facebook and platforms and prophets. Oh, don't. I'm not even going to go there today at all. I'm not. Promise. Done. Last time I'm going to say prophet. Saying, oh, there's something about to come out. There's something about to be released. There's something in the next few days, in the next couple of weeks, because you, what about the last time you said that? What about two months ago? What about a month ago? What about three weeks ago, two weeks ago, four days ago, when you said that before about a few days and a few weeks? What about those things? Friends, we're holding on. America's on life support. And we're holding on to her and we're looking her in the face. We're saying, please don't die. Please don't die. Please don't die. Because if you die, we have nothing left. And friends, that is where we're headed. It's where we're headed. I think I shared this, but in case I didn't already in a previous episode, I was speaking to an acquaintance, a friend. I would not call her Christian. I would not consider them a believer by evidence and fruit of life. It's not a criticism. I'm just trying to explain what I'm talking about and why. And we were having a very interesting dialogue about the condition of this nation. And she said, quote, I'm just not ready to let America go yet. I think I've already referenced this now that I say it. Well, it's bear it bears mentioning again. That right there sums up the whole wide way evangelical patriotic church. She's just not ready to let America go. Her identity is too wrapped up in her. I'm not ready to let her go. Friends, I'm telling you, right as sure as I'm sitting here, you will have to let her go. You will have to let her go. The life of following Yeshua Messiah is an exchange life, friend. And when he said, you leave everything behind and everyone, the call to come out, he meant it. He meant it. When Yahweh called Abraham out to go, he meant it. Like for real. Get up and go. Leave. Now, as is many, many things, it's it's primarily got to begin in the in the heart of all of the capital C church of saying, can you let your allegiance go? Can you let it go? It's a question. It's before us. I don't know how we're all going to answer. I don't know. All right, so let's look at a couple other things. Again, again, we're talking in this episode specifically why. What's wrong with America, Joel? What's the big deal? We're explaining that in measure. We're not even going to scratch the surface. Okay, if there's anything linked to America, it's the star. Stars. Think in your mind of all of the imagery, stars and stripes, eagles with stars, um, 
everywhere, stars. Have you ever asked why? Has anyone asked why? Why? What's the fascination in, in connection between stars in America? Now, there's man, there's stuff on the internet that's just like crazy land that Christianizes the stars. And well, when you count the points, you have the Trinity plus, you know, oh my gosh, things that are just like, whoa. <laughs> Again, as we've already covered, we can justify anything if we try hard enough. It just takes a little bit of imagination. We can cram anything into a form. But obviously, a, a star, a long time ago, it was re referred to as a pentacle. In any kind of depiction, drawing, artist rendering, pentacle. Okay, it's what it is. We don't need to explain that, do we? But have you ever wondered why? Everybody knows that's alive today, presumably, then the inverted pentacle, the inverted star, it's what? Pagan occultic meanings has to do with the satanic church. You know, we've even made it kind of silly, right? That's just on the satanic Bible, <laughs> on, a, on a heavy metal band's album cover. <laughs> but like, for real, like, let's just talk historically now, not just through this media culture mindset. But like, what is the deal with stars, okay? I would encourage you to look into that for yourself because I'm not even going to be able, for the sake of time, to get anywhere with that. I'm just trying to present something for you to consider. Surely the U.S. star. It's a star, Joel, right? I'm telling you, everything means something. Everything. Everything means something. What makes the, the, the national fascination with the star concerning? Okay, well, let's just throw this out there. And again, this is just some findings I started looking through stars. As far as representations, nationalism. Why is, this, why is there a star that looks just like any star on all the patriotic stuff? Why is it on the flag of Cuba? Why was it on what was the USSR flag? North Korean flag. Flag of Morocco. Flag of Iraq. Why in 2000, now this one I didn't learn until hours ago today. <laughs> this one, like, oh, are you joking? I thought for sure it was something I would click one more time and debunk in a, in a second. No, this is somebody just being crazy. No, it's true. <laughs> in 2000, okay, <laughs> while Bush was in office, now look, in, look, into, look into Bush Jr. a little bit. Interesting background. Skull and Bones, Masonic. Yeah, interesting. Just a good, moral, upstanding, honorable Christian American guy. Come on, Joel. Gotta look a little deeper. Well, during his presidency in 2000, the Republican Party, the GOP, they changed their elephant logo. We can all envision it. Close your eyes. You see the little cartoon-esque elephant with three stars on its back. Well, for some reason that literally apparently has no logical explanation, they took those three stars and inverted them. Why did they do that? The whole world knows what an inverted star represents, right? I mean, everybody knows that. Why would they do that? And the craziest thing is right now, right now, you can pause this video and you can go to, I don't know whether it's GOP.org or GOP.com. I don't know. Haven't ever been there before. You'll see all, you, you load it and you see all this stuff, Fox News, Patriotic, 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 red, white, and blue. And guess what you see? An elephant with three inverted, can we just say pentagrams, on the back of the stinking logo. Why? <laughs> Masonry loves the pentagram. Loves it. All throughout history. All throughout history. The the George Washington paintings, I there are there are viewers that have said, man, I looked that up. I can't believe that. 
I've never seen that before. What's the deal with him holding the trowel and all this crazy stuff going on with the imagery and the paintings in the U.S. Capitol building where he's deified on a cloud with a rainbow and gods and goddesses pointing down, looking upon him as he's... Whoa, what's with that stuff? That's what I'm saying. What's with this stuff? In that painting, I think it was on the Capitol Rotunda, he's surrounded by pentagrams. And here we are now, 2021, right now today, GOP.com, Republican Party. Oh, look at the cute little elephant. Mommy, that's got pentagrams on its back. Oh, honey, don't worry about that. Well, you told me those are the devil. That's why I can't listen to my Slayer albums. No, honey, that's just for the bad heavy metal guys. Didn't you see the Franklin Graham video? Okay, Timmy, go on. <laughs> Right? I mean, seriously, y'all. Why can't we ask these questions? We have to ask these questions and say this stuff makes no sense. Makes no sense. It's crazy land. Okay, so here we are. Minerva. Ooh, Minerva. Uh, We talked about her (laughs) in brief. We referenced her name in a, I think it was Thomas Jefferson quote. Well, Minerva, she's an ancient goddess. We'll get to her more in just a second. But we're connecting all these things together, all this stuff, man. Rabbit trail, rabbit trail, rabbit trail, rabbit trail, all leading to the same place. America, pagan, idolatrous. So Minerva, we're going to get to her more, and so I'm a little ahead of myself. But we have to make this connection with the stars and the state flags and all this craziness. She guards the Golden State in the state seal of California. She's a woman. She's Minerva is synonymous with Libertas. We've already talked about her. Columbia, goddess li- goddess of liberty, Libertas, and Minerva, and uh, the goddess Columbia, District of Columbia, they're all the same. Throughout pagan deities, history, they're all the same lady, Lady Liberty. Man, I'm telling you, this, I don't make this stuff up. I'm not smart enough to. Well, anyway, she's on the Golden State and the State Seal of California. In this, the original 1849 design, there's the face. Oh, man, uh, this stuff sounds like crazy. You you can Google it the second I say it and find it. I'm going to skip that part. Leave you in suspense a little bit. All right, so I'm going to insert a little bit of... Okay, we're 37 minutes in. Deep breath. Scripture. 1 John chapter 5. We know that we are of God, and the whole world is under the sway of the wicked one, the evil one. we got to remember that through all of these things. All of these things now. America is not some exempt nation that Yahweh God has just picked apart and set aside because, well, we stand with Israel. Whew! Good thing, because everything else in this world is evil, vile, pagan, and idolatrous. Good thing we stand with Israel. Friends, there's there's a lot more going on. A lot more going on. All right, so we talked about In God We Trust arriving in the 50s. What about back in 1782, this weird phrase, E pluribus unum? Heard it, right? Seen it, of course. Probably a lot of younger people have not heard that before, but... I'm 47. I've heard it my whole life. I know. I've seen that. I know. Out of, from, many, comma, one. So, out of many, or from many, one. Okay, now I know why this is, this is purported to be in the national motto. I understand that. Out of many people, many states, one. No, well, there's, but there's two things I want to cast a little concern on this about. Number one, all of this muttering from the evangelical world that knows all the secrets that are behind every corner that nobody wants us to know, and the media is hiding from us, but we know because we watch the this brand new news network that they know the truth, <laughs> and they believe just like me, which we always talk about. Isn't that ironic? <laughs> They're always saying, watch out for the one world government. And, and everybody who hates Trump is for a one world unified government. Well, <laughs> we have to be careful that like part of the founding of this nation was saying, out of many, one. 
One, one state condition, one unified endeavor where all the, as we've already looked at, looked at all of the other lawgivers of, of, of history who believed in pagan deities and were openly idolatrous and received all of their oracles from other pagan idolatrous gods. Yes, all of those gathered into one out of many. One. It's a little different spin on that phrase we've heard our whole life. I find that very interesting. I think I'm leaning towards leaning towards that's why that's what that means. Out of what? Out of this pantheon of gods, we're coming down. We're creating one. My wholehearted belief, one deified people, one Babylonian people. One Tower of Babel exaltation of humanity where we look up at God and say, we don't need you anymore. We got it from here. I found that interesting when I thought about it today. Because remember, that was, the, that was the motto, if you will, of America from 1782 till like mid-50s, 1950s. Okay, so here, here let's, let's talk about this Minerva for a minute. Where are we at? We're at 40 minutes. Okay, so remember how Jefferson was quoted referencing this goddess Minerva just, you know, 30 minutes ago. Okay, so Minerva and Libertas are synonymous. They're the same throughout understanding ancient goddesses. They were always the same. She was the Roman goddess of wisdom and strategic warfare. Now, she was very unique because she was not some warrior princess lady. Lady Liberty, Libertas, Minerva, she was a little more beautiful. She was elegant. A lot of times you, you could see some of her. She was very revealing. Beautiful, long, flowing hair. She was often depicted as like, you know, kind of stoic, but beautiful, picturesque. Always doing great things for humanity. And listen, friends, it was not just a statue, man. These people believed it to their core. She, she was known for her self-defense. Never initiating. She was the goddess of justice. So when people were wronged, you called upon Lady, Lady Libertas, the goddess Minerva, okay? And you beckoned her to come and what? Bring you freedom. Bring you liberty. You were unjustly treated. Bring me freedom. Sound familiar, y'all? This is not happenstance. <sighs> Lady Liberty. Liberty and freedom. All the, all the things that signify in, in, in picture form, in symbolism, in slogans, point to this being so crystal clear, truth related. Lady Libertas, the goddess Libertas, Minerva, she brought liberty and freedom to those who had done wrong. She would sweep in, bring victory. But only, she didn't initiate it now, she was the defender of those who needed help. Doesn't that sound like America's jargon? Sounds to me like what I'm always hearing about how that we just go in. We go everywhere to help people. We go to help people here. We go to help people there. We send troops here. Why are you here? What are you doing here? We don't want you here. We're here to help you. We're here, we're here to liberate you. We don't want liberated. Get out of here. No, we're here to liberate you, friend. I'm telling you, that's the truth. That's the harsh truth of the pattern of this nation. That's harsh. I get it, but that's true. So, Minerva, Libertas, Columbia, she would always execute justice for her followers and at all costs defend their rights against injustice. Hmm. Man, that sounds familiar. It's America. <laughs> She's usually depicted as one who received Medusa's severed head. Okay. All right, Joel, you're talking crazy. Yep, I sure am. Google Minerva, M-I-N-E-R-V-A. You're going to start finding how in mythology, she was given the head of Medusa. She was, she was strong. She stood up for the weak. She brought liberty. She brought freedom. This is where it gets crazy, land. 
She appears on the official seal of California. She's holding a shield with Medusa's head on it, by the way. Okay, California. Well, that's California. That's not really America. Friends, be careful. Don't do, don't do that. <laughs> Roman history states, and you can look at pictures of artifacts online right now that show Minerva holding two shields, okay? And through the history of, of gods and goddesses and idolatry and, and, and ancient mythology, Minerva, Columbia, Libertas had two shields often, especially this Minerva version, okay? One was for peace and one was for war. Well, why? Because she was always reaching out and helping. She was trying to bring peace into war. She was trying to... I don't have time for all this stuff. I was, I was pretty fascinated with this thread that I found today. This is where it gets interesting, okay? An early American engraving called America Trampling on Oppression shows a woman that looks just like Minerva Libertas you look at the depictions through mythology all the way up to the early 1700s, late 1700s, these images are like mirrors of one another. Identical, okay? Identical. Same, same things going on. Same stances, same poses, same two shields, okay? So there's this, this um, painting depiction. I looked at it online. I don't know how to describe some of these old things. America Trampling on Oppression. It's found in a book from 1789. The name of the book is The History of North America. It shows on one shield Dr. Benjamin Franklin's name and head. You can look at it yourself. On her, let's see, that would be her right, okay? This is important. Well, what's that matter? You're going to find out in just a second. If, you, if we don't pay attention to these things, man, we're being deceived. Deceived, deceived, if we're not paying attention. Okay. So in this America Trampling on Oppression depiction from this book of 1789, The History of North America, on these two shields, one on either side of her, one is... Benjamin Franklin's head, and it says Dr. Benjamin Franklin. On the other side, the other shield, is George Washington's head. It says General George Washington. Okay? Benjamin, a doctor, peace. He's not a man of war. On the other side, war, a general. Washington, a fighter, a man's man, 6'2", burly man, man. Okay? Happenstance? Happenstance now? Happenstance? This is where, let's go a little further. Remember the Great Seal of America we've already talked about? And you know it probably in your mind. What's the eagle holding? He's holding an olive branch and arrows. Peace and war. Peace and war. The talents of the American eagle. And in the drawing, the goddess Minerva is standing Washington to her left and Franklin to her right. Peace and war. Friends, what do we do with these things? And again, you can find all of this stuff for yourself. And I'm only giving you snippets of stuff. What do we do with these things? Why? Why? Is that mere coincidence? <laughs> That's just coincidence that a man of peace, a doctor, and a man of war, a general, are on the same sides of opposing shields on, a, on an ancient pagan goddess of liberty and freedom. Eh, just happenstance, Joel. You're really stretching it here. I don't think so. <laughs> oh, man, we're at 50 minutes. Oh, golly. This stuff, let's just keep going. Man, if you made it this far, let's just do like a, a marathon episode. Okay, so that's Minerva. M-I-N-E-R-V-A. Look her up. 
This stuff, there's no end. Have I mentioned that yet? Okay. There's something called the Phrygian cap. Phrygian. P-H-R-Y-G-I-A-N. We're going to get to this in just a second. If you're a Bible scholar, which I am not, you probably recognize Phrygia. Phrygia and Phrygian are in your Bible, in the book of Acts. Okay? Shaul, Paul's travels, talks about Phrygia. We're going to get to that in measure because that's fascinating. We're going way back now. Okay, so there's this thing called Phrygian cap. A Phrygian cap. A hat. Okay? It's also called the cap of liberty. Now, now, once you become aware and alert to these things, you start to see it all over. Christian American patriotism, paintings, drawings, statues, depictions of, of Lady Liberty. You can go back to World War I and World War II posters, and you can see ladies wearing red, white, and blue, pale skin, you know how those used to look, with the Phrygian cap on. And it goes, oh, man, it's ancient old. Well, what is that about? Well, let's find out. None of this stuff is happenstance, friends. None of it. It's on coins. It's scattered throughout American imagery. Okay, so now, like, even Josephus wrote about the Phrygians. They were in the Turkish region. Phrygia is mentioned. Let's just get to it right here so it's clear. And you can look this up for yourself as well. Phrygia was in Acts chapter 2. It says some of the Phrygians came to Pentecost. Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach in Asia after passing through where? Phrygia. Okay, this is a real place, real history, biblical even. And this cap, this Phrygian cap or cap of liberty originated in some things we're going to discuss. When you see the cap, it is known throughout history to be depicting freedom coming through the Roman goddess Libertas, Lady Liberty, okay? Whenever artists' renderings drew things, depictions, scenes, goings-on, when you saw the Phrygian cap generally on a pole, a long pole, and the cap is on top, or it's on generally a lady, like a goddess, on their head, it says clearly that person, that circumstance, is in a condition of freedom, liberty. Why? Because it was understood that the Phrygian cap always represented freedom coming through the goddess Libertas, Lady Liberty. Always synonymous, okay? This cap, again, that always, un it was understood clearly that when you saw this cap throughout ancient mythology now, this isn't something somebody came up with in 1942. This is old, old. This Phrygian cap always signified that a, it was understood that the people in the depiction received their liberty from Lady Libertas, the goddess Libertas, who what? Again, as we've already talked about, we just went through, she, she felt bad for the oppressed, the weak, the hungry, the lowly, and she would sweep in and bring vengeance freedom and liberty to those people through her supernatural mythological powers. This is not happenstance. Lady Liberty. Columbia, again, as I've already talked about in previous episodes, Columbia was an ancient goddess. That's why it's District of Columbia, where all over the entire city are images of this goddess, Columbia Libertas wearing the Phrygian cap very, very often. Okay, so this crazy cap, a lot of times in colored renderings, it's red. When you see the cap, it depicted clearly to the viewer that freedom came, liberty came through Libertas. This cap is on the seal of the United States Senate. In 1783, Benjamin Franklin designed the Libertas Americana Medal. And this was in order to rightly honor, 
honor Goddess Libertas for bringing victory in the American Revolution. This cap can be seen on this medal, and it can, be, it can be seen on the seal of the United States Senate. And this is ancient old, from the goddess Libertas. Liberty. There are many statues from the early 2nd century where the Roman god Mithras is shown wearing a Phrygian cap. All right, we're going back 2nd century even. Okay? Mithras, she's wearing, he's wearing the Phrygian cap. It's other places all throughout the United States, man. A quick search for that, it pops up all over cities throughout this entire nation. And I'll just name a couple. This Phrygian cap is on the state seals of New Jersey, Hawaii, Iowa, North Carolina, and others. Why? Why would it be there? Why would it be there? And why is it always followed back this trail to Lady Libertas, a pagan goddess? Is that coincidence too? Is that mere coincidence? No. No way, no how. It's not. It can't be. Look into this just a little bit. I'm going to have to spell it. I don't even know how to pronounce this. Ouroboros. O-U-R-O-B-O-R-O-S. You've seen the symbol. You've probably never heard the word unless you're super smart. I had never heard the word, but I knew the symbol. This is an ancient symbol of a serpent dragon eating its own tail. It's creating a circle. Like you have the head and the tail, and it's eating it, and it's creating a circle. You've likely seen it before. Now, this originated in Egyptian iconography. It demonstrated the eternal life cycle of self. Now, why mention this? Now, I couldn't find this because I just, I literally just quit. I'm like, I just, at this point, I said, I just stop. And then I came back and inserted this here. There's still more to come, a lot. But why would I mention this? Because I started finding these different coat of arms, um, seals of other countries, of other nations throughout the entire world, throughout different eons of time, who had this same imagery that I saw, that I've been finding at the origin of this nation. And I see even right now, all around us, on our money, on our state seals, on our state flags. Like, this is this stuff's starting to pop up all over the entire world. The nations. And we're told, y'all, don't go the way of the goyim. Don't go the way of the nations. It's a warning, man. It's a biblical warning. Why? It's everywhere. Okay, so I found this this image in France's Declaration of Human and Civic Rights, okay? In 1789, this was enacted to, quote, preserve the rights of man. Now, this is France, okay? And I'm doing this to parallel the nations. This nation here is nothing unique. It's nothing creative where a bunch of men got disgruntled by being held down by the man and decided to rebel and and put down the cornerstone of Yahweh Elohim's commands and ways and create a nation. This is nothing unique here. To my point, again, 1789, in order to preserve the rights of man, these rights are liberty property, security, and resistance to oppression, end quote. And guess what is at the center of this image with angels, the same all-seeing eye that's on your dollar bill, and many other um, patriotic, American, Christian, everything. It's, it's, you've seen it. It's, what, what's with that, right? We're not even going to touch that. There's no time. The Phrygian cap on a pole. Right there, dead center. Of course, right? In France, 1789. Okay, so all throughout history we see these caps, often on poles, if not on the heads of people. Look into liberty poles. Then we're going to probably have to bring this one to a close. It's getting way too long. Liberty poles, P-O-L-E-S, okay? A pole, liberty pole. It was also called, in many depictions, And in history, a tree of liberty, okay? 
Now, this was instituted by this group of guys called the Sons of Liberty, founded by who? Samuel Adams. Hmm. Many modern-day patriots love these guys, man. I've seen, I didn't know their history. I, I looked into them briefly today because they started popping up with all this Phrygian pole business, Liberty Pole. I'm like, oh, okay, this, this makes sense. <laughs> Modern day militia, we're going to be like these guys, the Sons of Liberty. Well, these Sons of Liberty, founded by Samuel Adams, and often referred to as like the original patriots, they're the ones who said no taxation without representation. John Hancock was one, Paul Revere was one. If there's ever a depiction of the, of the patriotic American, it's these guys. And the, so the Boston version of these Sons of Liberty, they were responsible for the Boston Tea Party. Now, in prints from 1774, you can see these patriots covering men with tar and feathers. We don't have time to get into who, who were they doing this to and why, but just think about this. Grown men covering their opponents with tar and then putting feathers on them, and they would pour boiling hot tea down their throats. And guess what's in the background of this depiction from 1774? A tree that has the word liberty written on it. A liberty tree. Guess what's hanging from the liberty tree? A noose. Okay? <laughs> These patriots. And to keep this train of thought here, the nations, a painting in 1792 Germany depicts Germans dance, dancing around a liberty pole. Okay? 1792 Germany dancing around a liberty pole. You can see it. They're all happy. Guess what's on top of the liberty pole? A Phrygian cap. A cap of liberty. Friends, it's the way of the nations. It's the way of the nations. Patriotic, evangelical, Christian American, please listen to what I'm saying. You have been duped. You've been deceived that you're something you're not. I know that hurts, but you've got to hear it. You've got to listen, and you've got to ask the Father, what do I need to leave? What do I need to sojourn out of? Why? 1 John 5, 19, we know that we are of God, and the whole world is under the sway of the evil one. I'm going to say this, and then we're going to close this part, because, man, we're at an hour. I found this on a pagan website. I'm telling you, the, the thing that's, that's interesting, like anything else, when you want truth, you can't go looking. Man, you can't go to Fox News to find out the true founding of this nation. You can't go to patrioticamerican.com. You can't. You're going to find, you're going to find what the, the prophets... Oop, oh, I said the word. I wasn't going to say it again. If this favorable, ear-tickling word is, is easy to find. It's all over the place. It's in history books that you were handed in kindergarten and your Sunday school pamphlets and, you know, all these fantasaical oh, imaginations. So when you look into some of these things, it, 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 it a lot of times sends you to people who are pagans today who celebrate these things, who understand the ancient power within the idolatry. Okay, they understand it. Now, we're ignorant, myself included. Now, today, I've added a lot more knowledge and understanding to what I was ignorant of this morning. Thank the Father. But in many ways, still, we're just ignorant. We don't know imagery. We don't know iconography. We don't understand what that statue means. I touched on this, man, maybe a year or two ago on the podcast when I was sitting at a, a library and I was doing a study on Dagon. I'm doing a study on Dagon, pagan deities, uh, ancient understanding to mythology and all this stuff. And I, and I pause for a moment and I sit back from my laptop and I just look around and on top of these shelves in a library in a little hick town nowhere, Virginia, I see Egyptian busts of pharaohs. I see a sphinx looking cat and this guy, and, and this, I don't know what that is. And I'm like, it's everywhere around us. It's all around us, and we don't even know because we have not asked the Father to give us eyes to see things that may offend us and may drive us out. But we will be responsible, friends, 
for what we give ourselves to dwell within. We will be responsible. So this was on a, a, a pagan website. Like if you're a pagan, like you understand that's real life, like an occultist. If you believe that there are powers within gods and goddesses, little e Elohim, which guess what there are? You know these things and you live accordingly. Using them, you think, for your own good. Demonology. I'm going to read a quote that, that made me just sit back in my chair. In regards to Lady Libertas, Mithra, when you see the Phrygian cat, when you see Lady Liberty, excuse me, holding the scales and the balance, this is what you're supposed to do. Quote, on a symbolically important day, such as a patriotic national holiday, leave an offering at the feet of a statue or picture of liberty that can be found in nearly every established city in America. The offering can be a flower, a coin, a special stone, a crystal, or something that signifies freedom to you. Sit or stand quietly before capital H, her image and pray through it to the goddess that it represents. Friends, this should, this should wake us up. This should wake us up to things that patriotic America says we will hold on till our dying breath. Our liberty. Our liberty. Friends, I'm telling you, what if you've been deceived? The pagans know. The ways of the nations, man, they know. They know. We, the church, have been deceived. We've been duped. We have been drawn into being inhabitants and dwellers of a land that we were meant to sojourn through because we are people who are set apart, Yahweh, Elohim, capital E people, and we will not settle here. We are looking for a land that is yet before us that the Father is bringing us into. And friends, if you defend this nation at all costs, I'm telling you right now, if you're not careful, you will miss it. You will miss what's set before you because you're clinging so tightly to what you have now that you were never, in, you were never intended to inhabit. All of your entitlements, all of your rights, all of the constitutional demands that say, I will have liberty. I will have freedom. It's nothing new, friend. It's ancient old, and it's steeped in the idolatrous goddesses of mythology that has gone before us, where these little E Elohim are saying, you know what? We've got you. You see that seal? You see that state flag? We're here. Call on us. Call on liberty. Call on the bringer of freedom. We're right here. Friends, please listen to what I'm saying and at least prayerfully consider. Ask the Father, am I steeped in idolatry and I don't even know it? Because friends, if you're an American patriot, you are. If you're an American patriot, you are idolatrous. But there's hope for us to come out. We've got to come out. We've got to come out. Church, come out. Be free. You're not free. You're, you're in bondage. You just don't know it. I'm hoping this series will help you to see, help me to see, no, I'm not settling for bondage here. This is not the land of the free. The land of the free is over those mountains where Yahweh placed his name. And I am going to sojourn there with everything I have. And nothing's going to stop me. There's at least two more parts to this, probably three. We're going to answer, not in the next one, but the one after that, which would probably be part 10. We're going to answer the question, Joel, what do we do now? I've been getting asked that question from viewers. What do we do? What do we do? We're going to answer that. I'm not going to leave you hopeless, convicted, <laughs> full of idolatry, and say, see you later. We're going to go to the Word of God. 
We're going to go to the written eternal word of Yahweh Elohim and we're going to get an an- we're going to get a clear answer. You do this. This is what you do. So don't be worried. But first, before we can go in, we've got to come out. So friends, come out. So we're going to con- continue the series here. I don't know, two, three more parts. You've been watching and listening to the Path to Zion podcast. You can find us online 24-7, pathtozion.com. Couldn't be any more easy than that. Send us an email, pathtozionpodcast at gmail.com. Questions, concerns, names, links, information. Let us know that you are wanting more information. I'll tell you everything I know, which is not much, but it's a lot. (laughs) Like us here. Subscribe to this channel. Consider sharing this series with a non-believer, with a believer, with a patriot friend. Let's be bold, people. If we believe this is true now, if we believe this is true, we cannot hold back because we think we might get discarded. We can't hold back because we might get shunned. We can't hold back because people might call us rebellious heretics. It cannot matter anymore. If we believe in our hearts this is true, We will be, I think it will be demanded of us. Did you share that? Did you tell that patriotic brother the truth? No. I was afraid he'd he'd kick me out the door. We have to be willing. We have to be willing to be like the suffering servant who said, you know what, I'm here to do my father's business. I'm not setting up a kingdom of men here. I'm not. Who's my mother? We have to be hard on ourselves. We have to be willing to walk this ancient way. We're sojourning. Thank you for going with us. Tune back in. We're going to get to some more awesome stuff. Captivating, really. Thank you for watching. Amen.